Namaste and very good evening. We are at the 11th session of uh, the South Asian Online Literary Conference. In this session, we have with us Dr. Sri Chiranjeev Singhji. And to chair this session, Professor Dr. Alok Bhallaji and respected Madam Ajit Ma'am is also with us in this session. At the outset, I heartily welcome all the three dignitaries and uh, request first uh, Chiranjeev Singh Ji to share his views. Thank you very much. I am grateful to Madam Ajit Gorji for giving me this opportunity to participate in this seminar. Ajit Ji's word is command. So she when she spoke to me, she said that uh, I should read uh, an English translation of one of my Kannada pieces. And uh, when I saw the program, I found that the theme of this uh, uh, session was uh, humanism, culture, emotions, and literature. Well, now this is an all embracing uh, theme. So vast, in fact, that on each of these subjects, volumes have been written. In the West, humanism grew when scholars rediscovered the works of Greek philosophers, such as Plato, Socrates, who taught know thyself, Protagoras, who propounded the philosophy that man is the measure of all things that humanism became a part of culture. All the great Renaissance artists like Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Raphael, Cellini, Titian, and others further developed humanistic ideals. In the West, humanism grew in opposition to religion and the stranglehold of church. In India, on the contrary, Humanism has been part of our religious traditions. The Bhakti movement was a profound expression of humanism. Before that, Jainism declared nonviolence as the greatest dharma, and Buddhism made compassion a central tenet of the faith. In modern Indian languages, the foundation of literature was laid by saint poets and gurus. Their humanistic compositions raise emotion also to sublime height. In our culture, humanism, literature, religion, and emotion have never been separate as in the West. To understand the Indian approach, let us consider a composition by the 16th century, great Punjabi Sufi poet, Shah Hussain. Shah Hussain saw a handsome Brahmin boy, Madhulal, and it was love at first sight, ecstatic love. In love, they became one. Shah Hussain became Madhulal Hussain, and Madhulal lies buried next to Shah Hussain in Lahore. A festival called the Festival of Lights is held at their shrine every year. The great ruler of Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, used to lead the festival procession to the shrine, comprising Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus. Shah Hussain sang, 
my arm is in my love's hand how do i say leave it love and passion they know whose bones are pierced by it says husain the mendicant my love make your eyes meet my eyes shah husain's and madhulal's love has layers of meaning it transcends all the labels that can be put on such love it became spiritual and divine when people sing and dance in ecstasy during the festival of lights at the shrine it represents all that we understand by culture emotions humanism and literature this is the culture of oneness oneness which guru nanak dev put in the numeral form of one before omkar ek omkar this is culture as it is lived interestingly there is no word equivalent to culture in indian languages the word sanskriti was a new coinage as was the related word sabhyata incidentally the word culture in english language also dates from the early 19th century its use in the sense of collective customs and achievements of a people dates from 1867 instead of this western concept of culture we had the concept of dharma which is all embracing guru gobind singh ji wrote salutations to the one who is in the song of songs music of the music dance of the dance and sound of the sound now let me read an extract from my uh, kannada book yava janmada vaitri about the great singer gangubai hangal akka to all of us gangubai ji for me personifies the best that is in our culture and this is a short extract from an article in uh, my book gangubai ji chided bhimsen joshi hey bhimana what are you doing in our gharana we do not sing like that bhimsen joshi answered apologetically akka ore what can i do aaj is kirana gharana i have also opened a kirana shop whatever people ask i give them his reply was humorous but it showed the supreme position that gangu bai ji occupied in music and respect in which peers like bhimsen joshi held her her music was perfect as was her dedication her music her practice her life her personality all had become one her life itself had become music her personality was as great as her music according to shastras an artist has to follow moral and ethical discipline and dharma yam niyam dharma and become a good human being those who knew gangubai ji had the highest regard for her in her life she practiced the dharma of music of domestic duties and of a good citizen pleasure and pain were born with equanimity all this gave her music depth and gravity such music makes you realize nad brahma the divinity of sound whenever gangu bai ji visited us she would bring some delicacies made by her for the children the greatness of the great is reflected in the small gestures also she showed that to be emancipated a woman need not be more like a man her courage and stoicism when she fought cancer melted our hearts akka her daughter krishna as accomplished a singer as her mother and daughter in law lalita 
all three suffering from cancer lying side by side in the hospital was a heart rending sight. But there was no complaint on their lips. There was only acceptance and grace. Whenever Akka came, she always talked of uh, the good times she had in life. Akka was a devotee of Krishna. She went to visit the Krishna temple at Udupi. Pejavar Swamiji, on coming to know that she was there, requested her to sing. Akka hesitantly said, Swamiji, in our gharana, we don't sing bhajans. Swamiji said, sing what you like. Whatever you sing will reach there. He raised his hand to the sky. Thank you. Thank you, Shiranjusu, for your brilliant talk, charged talk. And your seasoned insights into oneness of culture. Thanks a lot. Uh, as uh, Saida Hamid ma'am is yet to join us on screen, I will come directly to Professor Dr. Alok Bhallaji, who chairs this session. I understand uh, that Bhalla sir will uh, talk about uh, Kumar Narayanji, distinguished Hindi poet, whom uh, unfortunately we lost recently, and uh, will recite uh, a few of Kumar Narayanji's poems as well. Professor Dr. Alok Bhallaji. Thank you, Jenny. Very much. Ajitri, hello. Um, glad to see you. Thank you for organizing this once again. Um, Dr. Chiranjeev, uh, Ch Chiranjeev Singh Ji, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed um, your anecdotal history of uh, the two, two great musicians. So thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to say about Kumar Jeeva compliments in some ways um, what Dr. Chiranjeev Ji Singh has said. Um, this is what I'm going to read to you uh, is a section from my translation of a long epic poem called Kumar Jiva by Kumar Narayan. This was the last uh, published work of Kumar Narayan. It was published in 2015. Um, a brief introduction first. Kumar Narayan was a great Buddhist teacher and scholar uh, of the late fourth century. He was born in 344 uh, AD or Common Era CE and died in 413. He was, this, his father was um, a Buddhist um, teacher and a priest from Kashmir and his mother was a princess from Kucha. I just briefly describe what Kucha is. Kucha is a major Buddhist center on the Silk Road of China. And Kumar Jiva, their son, uh, became a very great Buddhist scholar by the age of 20. Uh, he was educated first in, 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 in Kashmir. Uh, in the initial stages, he was a Saraswati Vad Buddhist. But later on, he came under the influence after reading Nagarjuna. Uh, he became a he became a Mahayana Buddhist. Um, he's the only scholar. Now, just briefly, Kumar Narayan, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, Kumar Jiva is regarded as not only a great Buddhist scholar, but also one of the greatest translators of Buddhist texts from Sanskrit and Pali into Chinese and Tushari or Trokhyan as it was called and is single-handedly regarded to be responsible for the massive spread of Buddhism in China and then in Japan. His text, his translation of both the Diamond Sutra and the Lotus Sutra is still recited till this mor every morning by the Dalai Lama before he begins his day's work. Now, I should mention that Kumar Jiva is, we know very little about him 
except the fact that he's probably the only scholar about whom and for whom wars have been fought. Um, he lived in, in his early life after his training in Kucha on the Silk Road and the emperor of a place called Xiangyan, which is on the western end of um, the Silk Road, want, tried to persuade him to leave Kucha and come to Changyan and become the priest of his kingdom. Uh, Kumar Jiva hesitated. So as he hesitated, um, Fu Yan, Emperor Fu Yan, sent his general, uh, Lu Guang, to Kucha to defeat Kucha, which was a separate kingdom, and abduct uh, Kumar Jiva. Well, Lu Guang actually uh, defeated the armies of Kucha and then decided to set himself up as a warlord of Kucha and keep Kumar Jiva. And he kept Kumar Jiva for 14 years in his prison. It is there that he learned Chinese and became the great translator we know. In addition, um, Lu Guan also forced Kumar Jiva to marry the, the, prince, the daughter of the emperor or deposed emperor of Kucha, thereby destroying his vows as a monk. Well, after 14 years, negotiations were held, and eventually Kumar Jiva, after 17 years, sorry, Kumar Jiva was allowed to go to Changyan, where he set up a Buddhist monastery and a translation center. It's the major, first major translation center that we know of. And he managed to translate with his team of uh, monks and scholars, 250 um, scrolls from uh, Pali and Sanskrit into Chinese. Um, so that is basically the background. And he died, of course, fairly young at 401. What I'm going to read to you is a small section, as much as time permits, and I would request you to please alert me. More uh, the stipulated time, but in case I am overrun, overshooting the time, please let me know. This is a section um, from the poem, uh, which says, which begins with uh, Kumar Shiva returning from Kashmir after his education and going to Kucha and spending a time, a year in Kashgar on the way. And as you know, Silk Road was the major road for caravans and trade between China, India, and, the, and the, what is now called the, the Middle East, as far as actually Greece. Okay, the poem goes something like this. A caravan of merchants, travelers, and Buddhist monks from Kashmir had just arrived at Yarkhand. The markets are bustling with excitement at the arrival of the new visitors. The shops are brightly decorated with the latest and newest goods. Small groups of merchants gathered around the shops are busy bargaining. Kumar Jiva and Jiva, that is his mother, Kumar Jiva and Jiva, along with the other travelers, find a place to stay in a Buddhist monastery, where as if by the great grace of the, where as if by the act of divine grace, Kumar Jiva meets the Mahayana scholar, Acharya Surya Soma. The long conversation about Sarvastivad and Mahayana Buddhism lasts for days, during which they discuss the great Indian thinker, Nagarjuna. Kumar Jiva begins to understand that passing through all the diverse paths, all disagreements and differences, there is a middle path an essential point of balance, a bindu. Kumar Jiva thinks, how strange it is to break the original unity of being into two extra extreme ends and imagine a civil war between them. This metaphor of war is fundamentally mistaken and it is a waste of energy. Why isn't there peace between the opponents and forgiveness? Is there no middle path between the two extremes? We should know the ethical contradictions, but not linger there. 
return to the still point within oneself where it is possible to find peace. Stepping out of a narrow lane in the city, Kumar Jiva comes to an open space. He remembers that an Arahant had once looked at him and predicted, this young man is richly endowed with an extraordinary intellect. And if he can till the age of 35, to restrain his sexual desires, he'll be a unique teacher of Buddhism. Kumar Jiva is startled by the recollection. I have already chosen my path. I do not want to be a Buddhist preacher, but a student, scholar, translator, and a teacher of Buddhist scriptural texts. My fight is not against the senses, but against ignorance. The Atma is the real master of this house, whose ultimate goal is Pragya Paramita. I aspire to translate the compassionate philosophy of sacred Buddhist sects from Sanskrit and Pali into Chinese, to preserve in Chinese the same resonance and meaning I hear in Sanskrit. The daily routine of a pilgrim to eternity. Caravans and sarais at nightfall, the call of the roads at sunrise, like the untiring journey, journey of a quill traveling across blank pages. The obstinate search for an unattainable goal. I must pass through these state trade routes and camps to find my own path. Kumar Jiva asks himself, who am I? Where have I come from? Where am I going? And answers himself, I am no one, nor have I come from anywhere, nor am I going anywhere. After a brief stay, my body's resting place, I shall be nothing. I have come from nothing. I have come from nothing. Kumar Jiva then wanders out of the city, sits in a boat near the shore of a lake. The boat floats under a canopy of stars. The small lake is suffused with the sparkling of starlight. A luminous moon drifts on the water like a glowing lantern. This visible incandescent world is the truth, is an illusion, is either all that is from being to being or is nothing, from nothing to nothing. Sunrise, lotus flowers floating on a lake. Kumarjiva feels the gentle hand of Guru Surya Soma on his shoulders. You seem to be a little troubled, Kumarjiva. Come, talk to me, sit with me, tell me your doubts and difficulties. And before you leave, I shall help you find, to the best of my abilities, some answers because I have faith in your intelligence. When the sun sets in, the, in one region, its splendor rises in another. This is the time for the Buddha Dharma to rise in East Asia. You have to spread its light throughout Asia. Kumar Jiva answers, I am confused by the concept of nothingness. The theoretical assertion that all religions are pointless. Because Surya Soma replies, one cannot trust one's eyes and senses. Our knowledge of existence is based on them. It does not take us far to its limited and is therefore in our eyes 
leaped to the stars, standing far in the distance, but failed to notice that the consciousness of starlight and darkness lies within ourselves. Okay, for a minute. Do I have a minute more? Yeah. It takes only a soft sound to open. Last minute, this. <clears throat> only one minute you can have, please. And I think I'll just. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt because we have to follow our time frame. I'm really sorry. Right. So the session uh, ends here. Thanks to Professor Dr. Alok Ballaji, respected Sri Chiranjeev Singh, sir. And of course, hearty thanks to Ajit Ma. Thanks a lot. This session ends here. Uh, immediately after this, we will begin our 12th session, uh, which will include interviews and conversations. Please look forward. Thanks a lot.